of the uh, Stargate SG-1 uh, franchise documentary. I'm delighted to play the role of Master Braytick in uh, Star Stargate. Um, Tony, 1997 to 2007. 2007, uh, Stargate SG-1 finished all of uh, 13 years ago. Does it feel that long or does it almost feel like yesterday that you were uh, shooting on set? You know, it sort of feels like uh, yesterday uh, sometimes, and then other times it feels like it's ancient history, but um, it's still very present uh, in my, uh, you know, in my feelings and my thoughts. And certainly, you know, because of the fans on Twitter and, uh, you know, other social media, um, it's, uh, it still seems present. There still seems to be a great hunger for it. And uh, that pleases me so. I suppose, uh, Tony, you're probably the most prominent uh, recurring uh, starter actor on the show. I suppose 26 episodes uh, you featured from season one all the way up as far as uh, season 10. And as the sort of uh, recurring actor in that sort of uh, role that you had, were you always aware that you'd be coming back uh, season after season for guest appearances? Or did you take it as uh, this episode could be my last appearance on uh, Stargate or my forces or did you have an idea that your character would keep coming back uh, season after season? Yeah, no, no, I had no idea. I went up for one episode that you, I was never told, oh, this could be a recurring, which oddly in my experience is when you tend to recur. When they tell you at the beginning, oh, it's going to be a recurring, we're going to do this. Generally, uh, you know, there's disappointment behind that door. But if you go on and you hit it off and you uh, all of a sudden have good chemistry with, you know, uh, Chris Judge, Tilk uh, and, uh, you know, Richard and adversarial uh, tension uh, and humor, uh, they, they write for you. So that's the best uh, sort of compliment. But there was no notion going in, oh, you're going to do uh, whatever, you know, two or three. As a matter of fact, if you look at the way it fell, I only did one in the first season. I did two in the second. And then all of a sudden I would do two for several years. Then I did three in one season and then it sort of just grew. And um, so it was something very organic about it. And uh, that, that was wonderful. And uh, I'm very appreciative uh, to Brad and uh, you know, Coop, Cooper and, uh, um, and all the people that um, sort of kept writing for me. And, and Chris for that matter, because Chris wrote several episodes uh, to to, um, to sort of uh, explore our storyline, and that was uh, that was wonderful and beautiful, Vancouver. <laughs> and uh, Tony, how did the opportunity come about for you to get cast as a uh, master of Bray attack in Stargate SG One? Were you so sounded out for the role? Were you sort of approached, or did you audition for it, or was it by opportunity that it just came about at the right timing? You know, it came about at the right time. I had just finished the Mask of Zorro. I was back in town for. Mm, maybe about a week, two weeks, and it fell. I got the audition. I remember specifically, I got the audition just before 4th of July, so everything closes down in the States for a couple of days, and it gave me the time to work on it. And uh, I, re I worked very hard on it, not only because it was a very fun, interesting role, but because it was being shot in, uh, in Vancouver which is uh, one of my favorite cities. And uh, so initially it was, you know, the big thing was, hey, I got work, hey, it's in Vancouver, fantastic. And, and little did we know that that role, you know, sort of exploded into, uh, you know, as you say, 26 episodes and just, you know, great friendships and great, um, great uh, sort of uh, a conversation, an ongoing conversation with the fans and et cetera, and being part of that, uh, you know, wonderful franchise. So it, uh, it was a life changer in some ways. Yeah. And were you aware of the, the sort of who, when you were approached, were you aware of the, the cast that was already on the show? Were you informed who you'd be appearing uh, beside? Uh, uh, yeah, I was, I, I, I knew it was Richard. Richard Dean Anderson, of course, and, uh, you know, and Chris Judge and uh, Michael Shanks and Amanda Tapping. So I knew, uh, you know, you sort of do your homework. And, uh, but because my attachment <clears throat> was to Chris, you know, I actually sort of looked into Chris more than anyone else. Obviously I was very aware of Richard, but I looked into Chris to say, who is this guy that I have to care 
that, you know, it's sort of, you know, my whole heart is about this guy, who is he? And, uh, you know, when I first met Chris, uh, it was easy to care about him. So, and it was, um, you know, so it, it worked, it worked very, very well. And uh, we were tossed into the belly of the beast. The first scene we shot <clears throat> was uh, Tilk's arrival back at his uh, ancestral home, which is Bern. And I'm there, you know, guarding, because I know if, if he comes back, he's going to come here. And I'm here to warn him and protect him. And, um, and then I meet this strange SG-1 team, you know, who, you know, are fighting alongside of Tilk. And I, I'm puzzled. It's great. It's wonderful to be puzzled as an actor because it gives you somewhere to go to get clarity. And along that way, if you're lucky and the writing is good, can be humor, drama, tension, whatever you, uh, whatever you want. And I suppose, uh, Tony, in terms of um, you've worked in an awful lot of uh, movies, you've worked in an awful lot of uh, TV series, yeah, even before your time in uh, Stargate SG-1. When you arrived on the set there on your sort of first day in terms of uh, shooting, were you sort of taken back by the sheer scale of the production, about the sheer the, the sheer expense, the no stone or left unturned that they did in terms of the sets? the sheer scale of the sort of project and did you you've been around sort of good projects did you get a feeling from your first day that yeah this is a show that's going to run for a number of seasons well uh, yeah certainly certainly the, it was a show that they cared about and money they did have money and they had wonderful effects and um you know particularly as an actor when all of a sudden you get to wear the mnemonic head you know that sort of opens and you know the zat guns and uh, staff weapons uh, so, so I knew I was in good hands. Now, as far as you never know how long the show is going to run. And I remember specifically, it was maybe in the fourth year, fifth year, it was the episode where Tilk and I are, well, he's saving me by giving me his symbiote and we're, we're sort of on a beach amidst a, a, a massacre. And we shot that in the banks of the river up by the airport. And I remember overhearing a discussion between, uh, uh, you know, various people, are we coming back for another season, aren't we? And it, we were waiting for perfect light. That's, you know, that golden sun, sunset light. And, uh, and I'm looking, and in the river, the Fraser River, the salmon are running, and they're jumping out. You know, when they're, 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 they're running, so they're literally just jumping out of the water, and the sunlight is catching them. And I remember leaning over and saying to Chris, uh, don't worry, guys, you, you're, you're coming back. He said, what, don't worry, trust me, you're coming back. What, Finally, he said, what do you know? What do you know? I said, well, look, even the salmon are jumping out of the river to get a look at Stargate. And uh, <laughs> we all cracked up. And when you think about it now, we got five additional seasons. That was probably the fifth uh, season, four going on five or five going on six. And we, it, the fact that we did 10 was fantastic. And I suppose, uh, Tony, uh, you are very sort of well-averse sort of an actor. Uh, you're a busy sort of schedule. How, was it easy sort of to make time each season to appear in, uh, star, uh, in, in uh, Stargate? And were there certain times that you were wanted that you were tied up in certain sort of projects or movies that you couldn't uh, commit to and that you had to come back yeah. at a later time? Well, that's always, that's always a problem, you know, when, when you have an abundance of uh, riches and all of a sudden you're wanted as an actor in two places at the same time. Uh, it's a good problem to have, but it's a bit of a heartbreak sometimes because you can't um, do it. It always worked out with Stargate. I was in a, another series called Once Upon a Time, and I missed several episodes because I was doing other things. But Stargate, we had, uh, I'll never forget, we had, uh, I was doing Cyrano de Bergerac. I was doing a play. And uh, uh, I thought I was clear. I, I thought that they would not be using me for the two months I was doing the play. And sure enough, they, they needed me. And I remember I called uh, Brad and uh, spoke and, you know, there's anything possible, anything to do. And God bless him. They changed the schedule around. So they shot me on Mondays and Tuesdays during consecutive weeks because the play was Wednesday through Sunday. I, so I would fly up you know, very late at night on a Sunday to Seattle. There wasn't a plane to Canada. A driver would pick me up. I'd get to my hotel probably three in the morning. I'd get up at seven and do, do that day. But it was so wonderful and so kind of them to, um, to rearrange that. So it has happened. And sometimes you just have to let it go. 
But uh, luckily with Stargate, I did not miss an episode where they wanted me. And uh, Tony, in terms of uh, Stargate, I suppose it has a global fan base all over the world from Brazil to Argentina, South Africa, Germany, England, Ireland, um, so on, so on. And uh, when did you start to realise on set that, wow, this thing is truly global? Was it season three or season four that you got a sort of a sense of the, how far Stargate had spread across uh, the planet, as the saying goes? Well, I, you know, I remember specifically, I, um, you know, I used to, I live in Los Angeles, but I used to fly back uh, east to visit my family with my wife on uh, Thanksgiving. In one of those cases, we rented a car and it was raining, we got in the car and we drove to our destination. When I got out, I saw there was a dent in the car, mm. in the door, with quite a, and I'm thinking, okay, now I drove from the parking lot to my home. So I knew that it was nothing I had done. I hadn't parked. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, we'll deal with it. So I go back, return the car. And as I'm returning the car, I go to explain, I'm just about ready to explain about this uh, dent and the guy says wait a minute you're the attendant you're in stargate right i said yeah 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 i am he said oh oh and he said it's the only thing my father-in-law and i agree upon it's the only thing it's the only thing and i you know is there could you take a photo i said sure i'll be happy to take a photo with you and then i explained to him about this dent that i said it wasn't me oh don't you worry about that he said don't worry about that and then i realized stargate was <laughs> It was a popular show. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, what a gift, because you're right, it's all over. Um, you know, I've been lucky because I've, uh, you know, between Stargate, uh, Once Upon a Time, Dexter, uh, it's always interesting. Sometimes I can see a, a glimmer in people's eyes. And I, the game I play in my mind is what show are they a fan of? Are they a fan of Stargate? Are they a fan of Once Upon a Time? Or are they a fan of Dexter? They're very different people, you know? So it's, um, it's, it's fun and it's, uh, you know, the fans are very respectful and, uh, you know, it's, it's never anything weird. It's always sort of, oh, you know, how wonderful that you appreciate the show and particularly a show that's run that long because I'll meet people now. Occasionally I've met the same family twice and the little boy, you know, it was a couple and a little boy. And I meet him 10 years later. And he said, don't you remember? We met it. And now it's a couple, a little boy who's now a man, his wife, and a child. So it becomes generational. And already the child has got like an SG-1 something on, you know. So it's, uh, it's quite touching. It's quite touching. And I suppose, uh, Tony, we saw an evolution in terms of your character throughout the sort of uh, 10 seasons in terms of having to deal with sort of uh, different enemies the whole sort of time. He had to sort of involve uh, from what he sort of knew uh, as, as one thing or one existence to a different sort of existence. And uh, it, it sort of as an actor, do you like that sort of evolution each year on year on and uh, seeing... Uh, different scope or different horizons in terms of having your character having his beliefs uh, questioned the whole time. Yeah I, yeah, I like that very much because it has to evolve. You know, I always think that he went from a warrior, a rebel warrior to a statesman. Hmm. It's sort of like, you know, uh, you know, the revolutionary warrior or something or, or, you know, for lack of a better, it's like Colin Powell, you know, who was, uh, you know, a major sort of general, a major, and then all of a sudden takes on a more diplomatic statesman role and all of a sudden I don't have my uh, my Jaffa cap anymore and uh and it was, it was interesting that all and it's a little bit like passing the mantle to Chris you know by the end of the series Chris is what I was at the beginning of the series in a kind of way yeah so it's uh yeah it's great it's really really wonderful to uh, and Tony, what was it like in terms of um, wardrobe for you on uh, set, arriving in, uh, in terms of your costume, in terms of getting ready? Was it an early sort of morning for you in terms of uh, shooting, uh, in terms of getting all the sort of, to make yourself look like uh, that Jaffa warrior? Was it almost like wearing a sort of a, a knight's armor or what knights are to wear in terms of, was it comfortable to maneuver around in? Yeah, it's, you know, I won't say it was comfortable, but I will say, as an actor, I, I don't mind discomfort if it serves the character. Hmm. 
discomfort for the sake of discomfort and you think you don't even know what you're wearing, why you're wearing it, that's another thing. But I was very, very clear and it gave me, it, it, it helped me mentally to get into the character. It was like, as you say, it was like a medieval knight, Roman stoic warrior samurai, you know? <laughs> It had it had um, it had a bunch of different uh, elements, and I remember uh, uh, when it was being created, um, the uh, designer. It was it was sort of a uh, what makes you what does it make you feel like what does it what does it do and and it was sort of her name was Christine, uh, and she was wonderful because you go in you do an audition. You get the job, and but you you still are sort of a little bit on edge. You don't know what you're wearing. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know about the cap, you know. And so to finally get it worked out, and I knew on some level, getting back to an earlier question, I knew that I would be used more regularly when they sent me for a uh, a custom fitting for my hat, okay. for my little skull cap. They sent me for a custom fitting, and so it was molded to my head. Uh, so that meant, you know, that they would, I, they would be seeing me again. But of course, then they lost that, and I had to <laughs> to do it anyway. Uh, but eventually, I wasn't wearing one. But yeah, what you wear is very important. And following that um, thought of initially the warrior, this, this sort of rogue samurai, because he is a rogue. I mean, Apophis is the head of everything. And if you look at what he wears then, and even if you look at the colors, they're gray, they're dark. And then all of a sudden, when he becomes a statesman, he's into warmer colors. Uh, you know, that's all conscious. That's not ac that's not an accident. That's that's the work the wonderful wardrobe designers do. Uh, and if you pay attention as an actor, you you'll get hints of uh, of where the character is going uh, by the subtle changes in clothes. Uh, one thing that struck me, uh, Tony, from uh, doing my research and uh, watching uh, sort of Stargate seasons is that there always, I always felt there was an opportunity maybe for a sort of a movie in terms of just the Jaffa nation and the gold and how that originated and how it came about and the, the whole sort of independence for the Jaffa nation and uh, the sort of war and their, their sort of history. And it, it's probably something that could have been very sort of successful. Do you think there was ever any thoughts of doing anything about that? Just looking at that sort of particular aspect of Stargate as probably a spin-off or a one-off sort of movie or something? Yeah, I think there was talk, you know, they, they did several, uh, as you know, they did several mo cable movies uh, and there was talk of doing more and then, you know, it just sort of got away. And, uh, you know, every so often you hear rumors that it's, uh, you know, it, it's going to be in the works, it might come back. In, in what form? I have no idea. I don't know if I will be involved or if any of them will be involved. Uh, but uh, it is sort of ripe to be continued, and there is a lot to explore. I mean, that was a great thing. It was sort of, you know, uh, one of the, it was contemporary sci-fi. It hmm. wasn't futuristic. Uh, uh, and yet they found ways through the creation of the, the antagonists to deal with, you know, contemporary issues like, you know, the Ori and, and stuff. Um, so it was very, very clever. And, and uh, you know, Brad and uh, Robert Cooper, uh, they, um, they really did a wonderful, wonderful job. And the other writers, of course, were fantastic, you know. Um, so I had a wonderful time. It was, uh, it was a real gift. And, uh, you know, I thank them and I, I thank the fans. And uh, it's uh, uh, one of the highlights. And I suppose, uh, Tony, um, in terms of the latter seasons of um, Stargate SG-1, we saw a sort of changing of the guard and sort of certain, uh, certain cast members, I suppose, Richard uh, Dean Anderson sort of moved into the sort of producing sort of role. We did character Cameron Mitchell was uh, created. Obviously, Don Davis, um, God forbid, and then View Bridges stepped into that sort of role and we did news that so the, the SG-1 sort of cast sort of re revolved in terms of a new sort of form and obviously Christopher Judge sort of remained uh, on throughout it all but how was that sort of coming back as a recurring actor uh, this time to work with sort of different sort of uh, cast members did it feel a bit different or just felt like the same sort of process the whole time? 
Well, it, no, it is different. You want to have a different relationship. I mean, I think my relationship with um, with uh, uh, Bo uh, was different than it was with uh, Don. You know, with Bo, it was, you know, equals and we were, you know, uh, all business and that, but there wasn't, the, there wasn't quite the, um, and it's in the writing, there wasn't quite the warmth uh, that existed, that somehow, you know, even, even the notion of, <laughs> of Don, uh, you know, Hammond of Texas, all, all of that. And um, with, uh, with Richard and Cameron, I mean, it, that was very different too, because it, I thought, oh, here's another hot dog. Hmm. You know, Braytag thinks, oh, here's another hot dog, you know, uh, and uh, so that was good, but it, it was great. You know, it's all, it keeps you on your toes, hmm. but uh, you know, Amanda and Chris, we're always there. Uh, Michael went away for uh, a season, right? And maybe a little bit yep. more back. And so it was, um, it was, uh, and the directors, of course, and the crew. It's so wonderful because, you know, uh, that was really the first time I worked in Vancouver and I've worked a bunch there since. And you go back and you know the crew and you know the directors and the DPs and you watch the assistants uh, the the ads all of a sudden being you know producers and then you know the the assistant to the camera people being now directors or dps you know it's a it's a wonderful thing yeah and i suppose uh tony i suppose the last question before i let you go now and probably the hardest uh, question to finish off the interview um just in terms let's pretend there was a stargate um uh, universe or star stargate uh franchise uh, sort of dictionary an encyclopedia and they put your character master Braytac into that dictionary and they left two blank sentences underneath it and they asked you Tony Amendola having played the character master Braytac to write those two sentences to portray portray him what would you like those two sentences to read oh that's very hard okay uh b bravery r reliability a attitude, T tenacity and trust. A um, what else would it be? Uh, aspiration and uh, C. Uh, what would it be? C would be uh, confidence in the future. How's that? Uh that's perfect. Uh, on that note, uh, Tony, an absolute pleasure talking to you today to relive your memories of your time on uh, Star Stargate SG-1 uh, playing the character Master Braytac. Uh, very much involved in the deep history of uh, Stargate and uh, we wish you and all your loved ones a prosperous into the year. Stay safe, uh, stay in uh, good health and hopefully 2021 there'll be a lot more projects for you in the horizon and who knows maybe future Stargate projects in the works whether it be uh, movie roles, TV series or cameo roles which you'll be appearing in. But for the moment, uh, Tony, an absolute pleasure and take care. You take care. All the best. Cheers. Thank you. Yes.